uh, while we're talking about the food, I want to uh, say a big thank you to Matt Grady for roasting a turkey for us in his oh. new oven. <laughs> and to Mary Riley for making lots and lots of cookies. And for the Burlington Food Project for, is that what it's called? Do I have that name right? Uh, the project out of the high school that prepares food and we they catered uh, the sides this evening. And then we're really happy to have Charlie McFadgen here on keyboard. Yes, thank you, Charlie. Thank you. And he'll be offering some interlude music between our presenters. And he'll, uh, yes. <laughs> we talked about him accompanying people as they commented, but decided not to. Um, so what we'd like to do now is uh, offer a 10 minute public comment period. Is there anyone here who would like to make a comment? Joel and then Rob. You want to go first? Sure, I, well, I, just, I just wanted to say that you're creating here. Okay. You're creating, we've known each other for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Rob Backus, I'm a Ward 6 resident and I'm closely related to Michelle Moraz although not biologically. <laughs> so I just wanted to say that you're creating a wonderful community event. It's really cool. So thank you. So if folks could just identify themselves before they comment, that'd be great. Okay. So my name is Joel Fitzgerald, and um, I'm on the steering committee, so it's, it's kind of odd that, that I'm going to talk. Um, but last meeting, we had Megan Moore here talk about um, water projects in the city and all that stuff. And then after the meeting, um, very shortly after, I got home and I had this sign on my yard. And it's talking about stormwater runoff and, and what the city has plans of doing and all that stuff. And, and it says to call the city with, with what's going on. So I, I called them two or three times and I got nothing back. And then I knew that this meeting was tonight. so I. I, I talked to um, James Sherrard, um, who was, who was, I think he's going to speak the next meeting, but I told him how disappointed I was when we had Megan Moore here last meeting, and, and Megan said nothing about, you know, plans of doing core samples on yards, on what we're doing, you know, for treatment of water in wards five and six, and I said I was really disappointed, and, you know, I think it was a perfect opportunity for her to, you know, to create a, a partnership with, with, you know, with this project with, with wards five and six. So one of the reasons I'm up here for is I don't want to be a complainer. I want to be part of the solution. So I did talk to some of my neighbors and our fear is this is, they're going to put bump outs in the road. And in some of the places that are marked are behind driveways and they're at odd places. So what I want to do is I want to be part of the solution and, and I want to, um, talk to my council person and the city to see if we can all in our little cove down there find a place to put these bump outs because we do support the bump outs and we do support the city but we think it's a great time to start a partnership with full transparency and have all the neighbors down there come up with a reasonable solution that everybody can like and instead of just coming home with these on our front yards and, and not knowing anything about it I mean when it says treat water, when you use the word treat in a sign on your front yard, you really get a little bit nervous. So I just wanted to say, I want to be part of the solution, but I'm hoping that the city does as well. So, so what the bump outs are is when the water's coming down the hill, it's hitting the, the storm flow down, which we support. Um, and what I did also talk about is the city maintenance of the current drains. If the maintenance was better and the leaves didn't plug them, you know, some of the water would go down them instead of going by them. So there was a couple things we talked about on the phone, but he is going to be here the next meeting, or, or one of the representatives is. So I, I thought it was a good opening piece, and hopefully it's the beginning of a good relationship on Glen Road. So that's all I have. Thank you. So, did they give any explanation? 
talk about it and why they didn't notice you before they put a stake in the ground? Well, I read something in the email, something about a July 10th meeting, and he said it was something to do with a $30 million project, and it was going to be in the city's um, green space anyway. And I said, well, you know, um, you know, you expect us to maintain it, but yet you don't want us any input on what's going on with it. So I think we had a really good conversation, and I, he was surprised that Megan um, did not bring it up, and, and so he was very proactive. He said, I will let Megan know. And then he emailed me the next day and said, hey, we really want to get in front of this thing. So I was very impressed that he did. You know, he was going to come tonight. And he said, I really apologize. And then, so he, he's, we're going to put him on the agenda for the next meeting. But he was a little surprised. And, and, it, and what surprised me is I went around the neighborhood and I didn't see anything else. And, and now I hear that you have them. But I mean, you come home and you got three stakes in the front yard behind driveways and, and it was, it was kind of startling for us. So anyway, I think it can work out if every building, if everybody's willing to let it work out. So thank you. Thanks, Joel. Uh, one of the things I forgot to do was to introduce the steering committee. So the Ward 6 NPA steering committee is comprised of myself, Michelle Moraz, Mary Riley, <laughs> Gail Rafferty, and Joel Fitzgerald. Mac Rady's behind the camera. I feel like Oprah Winfrey. Um, <laughs> What's under our seats? <laughs> <laughs> You're all going home with a new car. Um, does anyone else have a public comment? And what we're going to do is we're going to pass the mic so everyone can hear. The thing with this mic is you have to put it super close to your mouth to be heard. Super close. Super close. How's that? Okay. I just want to let our neighbors know that we are at the end of the uh, academic semester for our Champlain College um, residential students. I'm Sandy Eusen from Champlain College. Um, this is exam week. Next week is, uh, I'm sorry, this is the last week of classes. Next week is exam week. And so you will see students moving out. Tends to be on a staggered schedule. So I don't expect it to be as, as crazy as move in can be. Um, but just wanted to give you the heads up. And then I also just wanted to call out that we do have new um, rapid rectangular flashing beacons on South Willard Street, um, south of the Maple Street intersection. So that's just a great development that we hope will enhance um, safety for both pedestrians and drivers. So thanks, thanks to the city for that. Thank you. I was going to say, I'm Bob Lighty. I live near those blinking lights. And it's just amazing that they're in there now. Having personally witnessed a Champlain College student break the front windshield of a car, uh, which was really a horrible thing to see, having the city proactively put on these lights and, and a bump out um, makes me feel so good. It's a wonderful thing. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else? Okay, so we'll start our agenda, and we are very pleased to have our city councilors here. We have Joan Shannon, who is the South District Councilor, and Karen Paul, our very own Ward 6 Councilor. And if you don't mind just coming up here and uh, what we're looking for is an update on council activities, and then we will have time for folks to ask questions and make comments. And if you could speak into the mic, that would be great. So the, we're picking up audio for the video through that mic. That one? No, just that, right there. Well, we have to turn it on. Oh, it's okay. Wondered, just curious. No, it is. Yeah. But do you do we need to get like wicked close? <laughs> like wicked close. Yeah. <laughs> we should actually be used to this. At the council meetings, we tell people that when they're this close, they're not close enough. Um, so, goodness, there's all, a lot going on. Um, I'll try to cover a couple of things. Um, we now have, as most of you know, a new design and a timeline um, 
for the for City Place. Um, the uh, construction uh, is uh, slated to start. Um, actually, it's actually there's even a date. It's August 10th of 2020. Um, projected completion date in 30 months, which would be February 2023. And there are um, phases and benchmark dates along the way. Um, so that was certainly great news. And uh, as many of you probably know, the project is much reduced in scope and scale and size, um, which I think makes most people happy. Um, I know it makes me happy. Um, and, uh, um, and there's more of a holistic approach to the entire project because of course now we have the, they are able to incorporate the former Macy's property. Um, so the, the schedule does include, um, it does anticipate a fairly smooth ride for permitting, um, but there is some wiggle room um, in terms of timing to be able to get construction to um, August of 2020. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that uh, I had had a couple of people who had asked me um, over the last couple of days about the about our council meeting. We had a vote to amend our um, our TIF request for tax increment financing, and that's because of the timeline on City Place. It's not about the City Place project; it's about the TIF request. Voting no on that would have meant that we were out of compliance with TIF law, which would also affect our audit that's done by the state. So there really wasn't, really wasn't a no. This was really a yes because, in fact, um, uh, the project is amended, and most of the people that were opposed to the project were opposed because of the project. Now the project is smaller. Uh, it's going to take more time because, of course, it's got to go through public engagement and a permitting process. Um, but I think we're on a good track. At least, at least it appears. I think cautious optimism is where what I would call my approach to this. Um, then I just wanted to also mention, just because it happened two days ago, um, two days ago was the deadline for um, RFP submissions for the memorial project. Um, that went out in October. Responses were due on the 2nd of December. Um, there were a couple of operators who responded to the RFP. Um, and uh, the same consultant that's working on City Place for us is wa also working on Memorial. Um, there would be, there is funding for that project through, um, through TIF, through uh, a general bonding for the city, which would obviously come to a ballot vote. Um, hopefully in November of 2020, um, and uh, they've come a long way. There was an $8 million funding gap, and they have through a lot of looking at a lot of sources and as well as... I'm going to interrupt you just a sec. Let's just be clear, you're talking about Memorial Auditorium. Memorial Auditorium, yes. Yeah, sorry about that. Did I? I yeah. thought it, Okay. I thought I said the Memorial, but okay. Yeah, you said Memorial. Okay. All right. Um, so in any event, um, that's come a long way over the past uh, year or so um, in order to accommodate all of the amenities and modernizing the building. It is fairly costly um, and part of our agreement with the schools in terms of the bonding for the new high school meant that we as a, the city side of this equation had to give up a little bit of our capacity, our debt capacity. So it was a matter of finding a, a happy medium in terms of moving this project forward and we'll see where we go from there. And then just wanted to mention uh, City Hall Park is on schedule despite the fact that we had a bit of an early winter. Um, and uh, the last thing that I saw on this, which was about a couple of weeks ago, was that it still is on schedule for an opening late summer of next year. Um, the roundabout, uh, is still on the timeline to begin 2021 for completion in 2022. The only thing that may get in the way of that is the Champlain Parkway because obviously we can't do both at the same time. Um, and uh, then one other thing, the budget, the Board of Finance is working with the mayor on the budget. Um, that will probably become a little more, uh, uh, we will know where we, where we stand with that. Um, in January, for now, we know that there are some funding challenges 
and uh, we are working through those. Obviously, if we had to ask for a tax increase, it would come into on town meeting day. So we need to, we're, we're actively working on that. And, um, and then the other thing I just wanted to mention is thank you for bringing uh, Joel the stake that was in your yard. And uh, um, I hope that if others have something like that that happens to them, that they will be in touch with us so that we can, um, we can work on that and uh, figure out what's going on. So thank you. I, I don't want to take up all the time, so thanks. Thank you. Um, try to mostly touch on things that, that Karen has not covered yet. Um, I just note on, on City Place, even though there really wasn't a no vote, all we were doing was updating, um, just telling the state what the new plan is in order to preserve our ability to get the TIF funds for the public infrastructure, which was broadly supported. That was never controversial, really. There were still three no votes, which I don't even know what that means, really, uh, to vote no to on an on an update. But uh, there were. Uh, I I just posted something on Front Porch Forum about that as well, and there are a couple links on there that are pretty interesting. Just looking at the different floor plans, so you can see what the program is and what goes where. And if you have any comment on it, uh, feel free to let us know. Um, and also the timeline, which which Karen outlined quite nicely. Um, I also serve on the the committee on policing that was recently formed. Uh, we haven't made a whole lot of progress, but the city council has extended our deadline for a report on that and asked for us to come back, asked for us to prioritize recommendations on use of force and citizen oversight. And I think one of the things that, that I'm learning, it's always interesting when you serve on these committees, you get to do a deep dive into an area of the city that, you know, for all these years, I've really never taken a, a deep dive into policing policy. Um, but we've been learning about the training that the police get um, and the our hiring practices and uh, a variety of things around policing and also hearing from, um, at the last meeting we heard from some families that uh, have family members suffering from mental illness who are calling the police regularly in their experience and they actually had quite a lot of praise for our police officers and the treatment they they get they say once in a while you know something doesn't go so well and we call back and say can you send somebody else but for the most part um, their experiences have been really good and, and our police work with uh, the street outreach program at Howard and have a very close relationship working with social workers. Um, and one of the things that has come out recently is that the social workers were cut back from, from six social workers in the street outreach program to four. And the city stepped up its funding to retain the four, but they're still down those two. And I think that they, they do feel that. Um, another thing that has been brought forward, and I don't know if it might have been covered at the last meeting, but um, there's been a proposal to bring back non-citizen voting. Non-citizen voting was a proposal brought forward five years ago and rejected by the voters. Uh, it's being brought forward again, and I would love to have anybody's input on whether or not you want to see that on the ballot again. Um, if you know things have changed for you or you see a reason to bring that forward again, I think that it's interesting that our um, uh, one immigrant city councilor is not supportive of it, and I think that there's some divide in the immigrant community as to some are for it and not everybody is. So uh, we uh, approved the purchase of um, many new vehicles at our last meeting, and the city has put out, as you've probably seen, the roadmap to net zero. And one of the components of that is the city is going to lead the way in, um, in trying to get our fleet and get the city as close to net zero as we can. And part of that is converting our fleet to electric vehicles. So in this round, we were able to uh, get three police vehicles converted to hybrids. Um, one large electric rider mower, which is going to replace the gas mower. 
Um, and then there were 12 trucks that are neither electric nor hybrid. I, and uh, we're told, I don't know if you have more information, but um, apparently they're not making electric bucket loaders yet. And when they do, I think we will be the first uh, in line to purchase them. But unfortunately, there are a lot of vehicles out there that are not yet available in uh, fossil fuel free models. Uh, we are, uh, you will see on the ballot um, an extra penny for the Housing Trust Fund. The Housing Trust Fund has, through the last reassessment, kind of got depleted in the process, the way it's attached to, um, to the tax bill. <clears throat> when, when the values increased, there wasn't an an increase in the amount of the uh, amount going to the housing trust fund and so the city has been making up for that through the general fund and we're trying to restore that uh, that penny that full penny um, from the housing trust fund for the housing trust fund I think the way it was was it was a penny for the housing trust fund but then in reassessment it got because it was revenue neutral it got reduced to half a penny <clears throat> um, roughly speaking. So there there will be a question on the ballot about um, increasing funding for the Housing Trust Fund. And I did think that it was, I think it was unanimously supported, no, Kirk voted two, two votes against it. Um, but it certainly has broad support, and I've heard broad support for it in the community. There was a proposal to put two cents on the, um, tax rolls for this, but we also have other funds that we're, lo we're looking at other ways to fund the Housing Trust Fund as well. So one cent seemed to be um, the place to, to start this, and I think that people should be cognizant of a couple of, of things when we're voting on taxes. One is that we've approved a $70 million school bond that has not yet hit our taxes. So uh, the other is with reappraisal, I would expect that we're going to see a shift in value from commercial to residential. So the, it's revenue neutral in that the city's not gonna collect any more money, but who they collect the money from is going to shift. Some people can pay less, some people can pay more. And if you look um, up the value, if you look up the value of your house on the city tax assessor's site, and you see that it's roughly half of what your neighbor's house just sold for, that's just like yours, your taxes are highly likely to increase, um, and somewhat significantly. So I've expressed some concern that when we go to the voters and we say. Um, this is what the increase is going to be for a $250,000 house in Burlington. Um, that $250,000 house isn't going to be a, a $250,000 house mm -hmm. two years from now. So, and we can't, I don't think we have any way to accurately tell you how to figure out what these, these taxes are going to mean at this point in time until we get through reassessment. So I just want to caution people and and keep that on the on the radar thank you thank you joan and karen yeah we want to leave time for people to have questions and comments so i've been asking you this thing why is it shifting from residential to commercial to residential because the value of residential is bigger or it's just it's just market value and so um, some neighborhoods have gone up more in value than other neighborhoods. Again. <laughs> I have asked you why it, commercial is going to be less than residential now. And you appropriately. Yeah, commercial, commercial property just has an increase can, in value. Can, you, can a municipality tier taxes so the commercial we has already, more taxes than Yes, Residential. and we do that. We've been doing that for a long time. I believe commercial is taxed at 1.2 percent of their of their value. So can that be raised? <laughs> that can be raised. They're already paying um, quite a bit more than their value, but yes. 
except what you just implied is, is that residents are going to be hit with a substantial tax increase. And yes. one way to upset, offset that might be to increase the commercial tax base. Yes. Uh, two questions, please. Uh, I assume that Memorial Auditorium, I haven't kept up with it, that is a rehab and, and not a tear down and rebuild. Okay. Second question is with with the new plan for City Place, are we now uh, are we now open for a total new round of legal obstructionism? Well, I mean, it, you know, it has to go through permitting, so there's a regulatory process, and of course, that could that could be challenged. So, so when you give it an August of twenty start date that could be fluid depending upon the, re the reaction of certain portions of our population that don't want this to happen. It, it could be, it could be. Uh, one of the, 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 the mo the, those people that were opposing the project, the primary, there were a couple of primary reasons why they were opposed. And those issues have been significantly addressed um, through the redesign, whether it's by, by, because of the economics, which some of it is the economics. I mean, we all know that, you know, office space is not, um, as needed in this community, perhaps even over the, over, in many communities, is not as needed. Um, we know that retail, the face of retail over the past even five years has changed significantly. Um, we know that housing is still a, a critical need. Um, and a lot of that has been taken into account in the new design. Plus, it is it is smaller in scope, and that was one of the biggest concerns of many opponents of the project. Real quick question: um, Could you comment on the library upgrade project? From the article I read, it sounded like the city wasn't going to provide any of the funds but maybe it's too early to tell and it's important um, you know I, um you know Faye I don't know a lot about that I was contacted by the library uh, I know that they are have been working through uh, they hired a consultant and have been working through uh, a feasibility study and I don't think that that has been completed um, but they are I think actively working to raise a lot of the funds outside the city. Um, it has not come before the Board of Finance, um, and, and but yet it is awfully early. So I don't know en en enough about that to really answer it completely. That's what I know. Do you know? I can't say anymore. Okay. <laughs> so um, can you comment on the Amtrak train coming in 2021 and uh, its overnight storage issue? <laughs> Um, so the Amtrak, it's been the strong desire of this community to attract uh, Amtrak to Burlington. Um, Amtrak is now coming to Burlington, but we're being told that when Amtrak comes, it's going to require a second rail. That second rail is going to go between the existing rail and what's now Main Street Landing. Main Street Landing, you know, many, I don't know how many, 20, 25 years ago or something, they got a lot of money to create a train station there. And there's, there's a lease agreement where they have rights that go about eight feet from their doors. Um, so that was agreed to quite a long time ago, and now the prospect of putting a rail and a, and a train there is not looking very appealing. So part of the question is, where does the train overnight and get serviced? And another part of the question is, is the second rail needed? The second rail goes right where the bike path is, so the city is working. Moreau um, had come up with kind of a a priority of what the how the city is going to evaluate the project and I think that it was really good um, I can't recite it verbatim but it included things like making sure 
looking looking at it from the perspective of public benefits um, and making sure that there was a place that, you know that the bike path was going to have a home and so we are working on developing the bike path on the other side of the railroad tracks and there there's still discussion going on to figure out if there are other options for uh, storing the trains obviously nobody really wants trains stored um, in their front yard or their backyard so so actually that and and you're waiting why um okay yeah I mean there there has been there has been an update to that just today um, that yeah, Vermont. Jerry Manick, uh, Kingsland Terrace. I think the latest I've heard is that the railroad would be putting in the second track no matter what. So it's really a little bit separate from the overnighting of the, the Amtrak. And the latest proposal is potentially a McNeil plant overnighting location. That's the latest I've heard as of about a week ago. Well, it's actually, um, as of today, um, yesterday the Vermont Rail Council met um, and uh, they didn't they didn't allow for a public public comment um, they met as a committee and they voted on the ideal location um, all of there was I don't know that it was unanimous but they were ranked according to you know preference mm -hmm. and the number one vote getter was the intervale uh, was around McNeil the one that came in last was actually Main Street Landing so, um, you know, it, it, it appears as though it's possible that that issue may be resolved um, in what I think most people would say is a pretty good outcome. Um, the rail, the rail, Vermont Rail Systems has a 50-year lease on that property, and um, it is within their ability to have that second rail line that is the next, as you said, that is separate. Um, they claim that they need that rail line not only for trains to be able to pass at night, but also because they have a dinner, um, uh, a dinner car, a dinner train that they run a couple of days a week. And having Amtrak as well as freight trains would impede their ability to have that train. So that has yet to be resolved. Hi, um, Charles Simpson. Uh, the uh, I was at one of the planning meetings for uh, memorials redesign, and what f folks said there is while the redesign concepts there were several offered and they were very exciting, but they all we all said well you've got to do the whole block because you've got to have the, the facility won't work without adequate parking. There's no adequate parking in that area, and the uh, Plan BTV of course calls for this being the gateway block and the whole block being being taken into consideration. So I'm wondering, in your call for proposals, did you ask people to redesign the whole block? And did you add parking? Um, my recollection of the RFP is no, it did not, um, it didn't call for the redevelopment of the entire block and nor did it call for parking. And I think that the view is that um, in a downtown area that it could be sustained as it always has been uh, without parking. And so we're looking for uh, an operator who can make it work uh, with a little, a more modest, um, more modest upgrades to the building. So we have time for maybe one quick comment or question before we go on to our next agenda item. Okay, great. Can I make one then? Yeah. So I uh, just wanted to say two things. The first is kudos to the NPA Ward 6 NPA Steering Committee who has done an amazing job to get uh, uh, great speakers, great conversation, wonderful food. Um, just when I think that you've got a really great meal, the next meal is better. So, um, and uh, uh, this is definitely an event not to be missed every month. We will miss it in, in January because there is no Ward 6 MPA meeting in January, but we'll be back in February. And 
just wanted to uh, just wanted to mention that while of course it's not everyone's responsibility to know the amount of hard work that the NPA steering committee does I want to acknowledge what they do because I know a lot of the work that has gone into making these events and uh, um, and thank you thank you very much thank you Tara. And I'd also like to give a special shout out to Ward 6 own Charlie, Charlie McFadgen for providing our lovely dinner music and creating a completely new ambiance at the NBA. Thank you. And that here is your interview. So, there we go. <laughs> yeah, for the change of each speaker, I think that's really nice. That's what, that's what we've got in mind. So. This is our gentle transition to the state representatives. Joey Donovan and Mary Sullivan will be presenting next. They'll be talking about what they've done over the summer and what they're gearing up to do in the session that starts next month. So we'll ask them to provide an update and then we'd love to have your comments and questions for them. And please speak close to the mic. Okay. Um, sure, I'll start. Um, I'm Mary Sullivan. I live in Ward 5 on Caroline Street. And um, I think most of you know that our district goes, it's mostly uh, Ward 5 and um, a fair bit of Ward 6. Um, so um, the thing that I wanted to talk mostly about is um, I've been active in the Climate Solutions Caucus since I went back to the legislature in 2015. Uh, I co-chaired it for the last three years. I've just stepped aside as that, um, as the co-chair. Um, this summer we really took, uh, had a road show. We had about, um, summer and fall, we had about, um, I think close to 20 meetings of people around the state um, to present our climate agenda. And uh, we've had so far over a thousand people who've attended these meetings um, to kind of let them know what we want to get done in this next session and to ask them to kind of help us move it forward. Uh, we uh, you always remind people that we have a lot of pressure within the building from the fossil fuel lobbyists and people like that. We need help from people outside the building. So um, they've been, we had a meeting Tuesday night at Burlington Electric Department. I don't know if any of you were able to make it, but um, I think there were probably close to 90 people there. And it was really a great discussion with a lot of people expressing their frustration, saying you are not doing enough. You are not realizing it's an emergency. Um, I do realize that it's a, an emergency and we need to really get moving. Um, the um, few bills that were, there's one bill, the Global Warming Solutions Act, and that would take our, um, the um, reductions um, goals that we have in law now and make them instead of goals, mandates. And uh, so that actually maybe we would start working toward them. Uh, we have been increasing our emissions lately instead of reducing. And uh, when these goals were first put in place in, two, I think it was 2007, uh, they were heralded around, you know, especially around New England as really out front. And it's a little embarrassing now that we haven't even, uh, you know, we have budgets that come from the governor's office that are not reflective at all. Um, of, um, you know, the governor has said that he uh, wants to abide by the Paris Climate Accord. And um, you've got to have budgets and you've got to have programs that allow you to start moving forward. And we don't see that. So um, with the Global Warming Solutions Act, the other thing about it is that there's a citizen right of action in it. So that if you, um, say an organization um, sees that we're not meeting the goals, they can sue the state. And that is the, um, the element that got Massachusetts really going. And uh, they are now achieving, they're actually uh, better than achieving their goals. So um, uh, we think it will really help Vermont. The other um, thing is the Transportation Climate Initiative. And this is, I don't know if you're familiar with REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Emish Initiative that was started under uh, Governor Douglas in, 
I don't know, 2008 or something, can't quite remember, but it has brought down the emissions in the electricity sector um, by working regionally in a cap and trade um, way so that we get um, money back and this money that comes back gets put into weatherization and other things that further reduces our emissions. So um, transportation and climate initiative will be set up similarly and it's mostly the same states that's involved in Reggie and um, we are it's being worked on at the administration level and um, our goal is to make sure that it keeps moving forward and that we get it um, into place very quickly. It's been talked about now for a few years. So um, that's um, mostly our um, climate agenda. Um, we passed a wonderful um, plastics, um, single-use plastic ban uh, last year. It's one of the strong, I think it is the strongest in the country actually. Um, and we're hoping there will be legislation that starts in the Senate, but will come over to the House, obviously, um, that will add to that. Um, I was trying today to find out exactly what might be in this draft legislation. Uh, I wasn't able to find out, but um, I know what I'd like to see in it, so I will really be keeping an eye on that. And um, there's a lot of single-use plastic that's out there that could be included, and um, other states, I think especially California, uh, has um, banned some of these products, so it's not unheard of. Um, and with that, I think I'll turn it over to... You know, one, one bill that we passed um, last session that I don't think got a lot of notice is that we codified in our statutes access to abortion. And that was the first time we did that, and I thought that was an important step. And we also have set forth a... a, a Try to make a word. Uh, plan forward that uh, we'll have a plebiscite on that and have a constitutional have be have it part of our constitution, and that is a very very involved um, uh, uh, action. It it'll have to go to, to a public vote two different times over a period of um, five or seven years, and um, I just think I'm so proud that we did that, and I never thought it got very much um, notice in the press or any discussions. Um, <clears throat> of course, two of the things that I think are going to be on our agenda the first day we go back in January is going to be the minimum wage bill and the paid family leave bill. Those are two bills that we worked very, very hard on, and um, the governor um, vetoed both of them. Um, the minimum wage was um, over five or six years back going up to $15 an hour. And, um, you know, here in Chittenden County, I don't think anybody can find anybody to work for almost $15 an hour. But in fact, throughout the state, we have over 60,000 people, largely women, single heads of household, that are working, struggling to raise children on less than $15 an hour. And um, I always think of them when I think about the importance of passing that. And also the paid family leave would um, be such an enormous help to families. I personally was able to take advantage of the federal family leave with uh, out pay uh, when my husband was sick and um, needed uh, health care in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And it was uh, a re wonderful relief to know that I had my job to go back to in three months and I didn't have to worry about it. And I think how wonderful it is now if we can pass this bill. You know, the governor um, uh, buddied up with the uh, Governor Sununu of New Hampshire to have it a voluntary system. Well, I think it's a system very much like Social Security. You're all in or it doesn't work. So hopefully that we will be addressing that. Another issue that um, is in my committee, Ways and Means, is the marijuana bill. And I just came from a very interesting forum at Contoys on marijuana, sponsored by this fabulous attorney general we have. And um, he had um, a fellow from Massachusetts, a fellow from Maine, both who have a system up and running. And um, he had somebody representing Vermont farmers, he had uh, somebody representing the credit unions, and um, then he had David Mickenberg, who is really um, knows this bill very well. 
it was a very interesting discussion and the, we have a bill in ways and means that we left on the table because time was up um, it has already passed the Senate and it's gone to uh, it was really uh, GovOps that did a lot of the work on this bill and um, it really has significant impact I think and it has um, lots of details and it's amazing that we have a product that we've legalized but you know we're looking forward now to be able to go and tax and regulate and that regulation that regulate part is so important that you can actually go and you know exactly what you're buying you know the product it's been tested and um, so I think it's going to be um, not only an economic boom for us but um, a very big step um, and also uh, I've just put a bill in that uh, Burlington would, and other communities would have an option, a local option tax on that bill above and beyond the taxation that's already going to be on there. Um, another issue that I think we have to deal with is our pension system. And um, I've also just put in a bill that would be a 2% surcharge on incomes over $500,000. And that income would be earmarked for um, the pension uh, system that desperately needs help. We have um, state employees that have done terrific work over the years, and they are not sure what they're going to get for retirement, which I don't think is very fair. Um, another thing that I'd like to say, I don't know how many of you know about VEPC or Veggie, which are business tax credits. And we just had a situation with the, um, the outfit that took over Global Foundries, Marvel, I think is the name of it. And they got a veggie uh, tax credit. And they laid off 90 people six weeks later. And I think it, it to me, it just, I've always questioned the program. It always was a but for, you know, we couldn't do this increase, but for this credit. And I would love to see some work done on this, that that money, that type of money goes into childcare which I think truly is an economic development tool. And I know how hard it is for families to find quality childcare, and I think that would be a better use of that money. So um, I could go on and on in my little pencil notes, but I think it would be more interesting to hear from you what you think is important and to um, have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, both Mary and Joy. <coughs> I don't know whether the political will exists. Uh, I strongly believe we need a four-year term for governor because there's absolutely no planning horizon in the state of Vermont, zero. As long as you are going through the process of trying to amend the Constitution for abortion rights, is there any reason you can't piggyback new terms for legislature and governor? onto that so that it does not become a repeat proposition maybe six or seven or eight years down the road you know it's a, that's been a discussion that's been so interesting i think governor kuhn and governor douglas i think with governor dean had two opposing views on that governor dean being very supportive of the two-year term because he felt it kept the governor going back to the people and, and being on top of it so um i don't really have an opinion on it um, I actually have a very strong opinion in the last time that I served through the 90s I had introduced legislation with um, a Republican member and I can't remember who it was um, to um, start that process because uh, and I am very much in favor of a four-year term um, for governor um, and definitely, definitely the statewide offices I'm not sure for the state reps um, I don't think our campaigning, um, I like getting out and doing door knocking every two years, and it's just not as onerous, um, and you don't have to raise as much money as you do. Um, so I'd have to have a conversation and see if, you know, maybe I'm not right on that, um, but I'm very much in favor of a four-year term for governor. I agree with you. Is there the They sure, they sure do talk about it in the business community yeah. here a lot. So at least as the press reports it, and I'm not sure how trustworthy that is anymore, 
the House and Senate did not get along last year, at least at the end of the session. How are you going to make that better so that you can get legislation through? Um, you know, I think that it might have been a little overblown. Chris Pearson, a state senator, just walked in, and Chris and I actually work very closely together on a lot of different issues. Um, but I do think there was a lot of work over the summer and fall to patch up some things at the leadership level um, that will um, work better this coming year. I liken it to just a family fight, and uh, it wasn't feeling very comfortable for any of us at that time. And um, I think, as Mary said, um, we needed that break at that time because things were deteriorating. And um, I, as she said, the Speaker of the House and President Pro Tem have worked very hard, I think, to um, open up lines of communication and that will um, avoid that type of thing happening again. I, in the years that I've been there, I never saw anything that felt so not right. I think we all hope so. Yeah, I just want to commend you both for bringing up paid parental leave. And, and um, it just seems to me if we can flip some of these systemic economic equity issues, especially for women raising young children in the state, including child care, that that's just more effective than offering someone $10,000 to move to Vermont. Um, I'm not bashing that program, although I would. <laughs> it did, did seem a little bit, um, well, a small program anyway. Um, and I think that if we can start to do this, people will move to Vermont and people's children and grandchildren will stay in Vermont if this can start to look like a place where you aren't driven into poverty by having children and right. you can never afford a home. I mean, we, we have to turn the curve on it. And pay parental leave, all the science is there. Um, it's better for the kids, it's better for the health outcomes, it reduces the, uh, the incredible drag on the zero to one child care system, mm -hmm. which when we don't have adequate uh, affordable quality child care for that range of kids. Let's, let's help people stay home and, and do what those kids need during that first year. So I just, I don't know, I don't know why we can't get there, I don't know why as a country we can't get there. It's embarrassing, I think, since the rest of the world's been there forever. So I just commend you both for keeping it in the forefront, and yeah, it's going to cost some money. I, I hope that you um, share that good view with the governor because I think the, um, the Senate and the House are with you totally on that. Uh, and the only thing I wanted to say when you said it will cost us money, it will. And everything we do, I think we need to look at the cost and the benefit. Um, too often we look just at the cost. Um, the benefit of this program is huge. Well, if we're taxing marijuana, where, where, where do we want to put that money? A lot of it goes, I think, to health care and education. Related. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so maybe I'm missing something, but Democrats have a supermajority now and can override a veto, theoretically. You know, but we are not a monolith. We're not. Um, there's some Democrats who really frustrate me. Um, there's not a whole lot I can do about it. They've been elected from their own district. You know, I want to hand them our party platform and say, could you please read this? Um, but. What do you do? I never liked that term supermajority because I knew some of the people who were getting reelected and I knew they wouldn't we wouldn't have their votes on a lot of things that were going to be really close for overriding a veto. And, and I guess I recognize that, but per the last session, it's really frustrating that family leave, other legislation was at your doorstep and the Senate and House dissolved in arguments among themselves. And I think this year, it being the um, end of the session, where you know things die if you don't do things, that this might be the time where we work hard to make sure that we can maybe override a veto. And I, and I think I think that we can build a coalition to do that. Um, the, um, I, I believe that the bill that will not be coming back to us because we cannot override the veto is a 24-hour waiting period, and that absolutely breaks my heart because um, that is a real suicide prevention bill, and um, I actually was really surprised that the governor vetoed that bill. Um, it's an important piece of legislation. And the, and the family of, um, of the young man uh, 
who, who they thought this, that 24-hour waiting period would have saved his life. They were dogged in being there every day and reaching out, and um, it was a very difficult debate we had on that on the floor. And they were sitting right behind in the um, gallery, and um, I just thought some of the um, some of the debate must have been extremely painful for them to listen to. It was very hard. Hello, Bob Whitey. I live in uh, Ward Six, and. Uh, I strongly support everything that you brought up. The one thing that Governor Scott says that embarrasses me is he brings up the police having the ability to test for marijuana. And police have been using marijuana for years to attack blacks in our state. It's really embarrassing to have him bring up that issue of empowering policemen to continue their horrible practices. There was just a case from Bennington in the Supreme Court in Vermont. How do we stop that argument? Because it's a horrible argument. If you want to arrest a person for driving poorly, arrest them for driving poorly. You don't need to have a marijuana test. The only, I mean, there was a long time we didn't have a breathalyzer test, and you had to get out of your car, and you know, I don't know what you did back then. Like, recite the alphabet, walk a line, recite the alphabet backwards, or something. There are, you know, those types of things that you can do to determine whether the person is in control of the vehicle. Um, if there's no more questions, just um, I, I had a long served on Natural Resources Committee, but I went over to Transportation Committee this last year because um, I really felt like people who care deeply about climate needed to be on um, a committee that really envisioned a transportation future that was much less carbon intensive. Um, and so we have a good number of people now um, on that committee, and um, it's a little intimidating when you get the governor's budget that's like this thick two weeks after the session starts. You know, that, um, so I think we're gonna be a little less intimidated by that this year. I've figured out how to kind of read through it and whatever. And you can't be signing on to the Paris Climate Accord and say that you um, really abide by the, um, our emissions reduction goals and, and hand us a transportation budget that doesn't really reflect that. So um, we are really going to be keeping our eye on that and um, really pushing for more public transit. And um, you know, um, there are going to be um, building of more park and rides. Um, there's a few of them that will be open, including one in Williston. Uh, and that's a, actually a very low cost way of getting people to carpool and um, or you know, drive someplace where the bus comes and hop on the bus quickly. So um, I just wanted to mention that. And take your time if there's any other thing you want to comment, because you have plenty of time. I just want to add that I did go to the um, the hearing that um, Senator Pearson and Mary and Representative <coughs> Odie had the other night at BED. And I think the most moving part for me was to listen to about three or four very young uh, one was a middle school student, uh, I think, I think two of them were, another was high school student. And the real fear that they have of their future and what climate change is going to bring to them, it was, um, it was very moving and very real. And, uh, and I think we probably are getting on the train a little bit late to begin with. And uh, I hope that um, all of you will kind of help what uh, Senator Pearson and, and um, Mary are trying to do in this. Endeavor. And um, I mean, I, I truly, I read a lot on climate, and I really hope that every time they go back to recheck the science, it's a lot worse than they thought the time yes. before. Um, and it just, I, I hope that we really get to tackle this before it's too late. And who, we don't know when exactly it's going to be too late. So um, it is a climate emergency, and we've got to start um, looking at it like that. I'm Matt Grady. Let me ask a question on those lines. Are we investigating a carbon tax, something that's really going to get the ball rolling? I know a lot of corporations 
are coming out in favor of it just today. IBM announced that they're in favor of it. We employ you know, several hundred people here in Vermont. Um, we don't, if we're really serious, don't we have to start doing really drastic things like that, despite the short-term economic problems that it will cause to really move the ball? Um, the, the TCI comes, the Transportation Climate Initiative will come, probably that's a cap and trade thing that does have spinoff, which really is carbon pricing. Um, a few years ago, I introduced legislation, uh, Chris actually, back when he was in the House, introduced legislation that was even stronger than what um, I had done with uh, David Dean. Um, and we couldn't get it to move at all. And uh, it was pretty darn frustrating because I totally agree with you that it is the way to go. And when you start pricing things that um, you shouldn't be doing, like emitting carbon, um, all of a sudden it starts dropping. So. Um, Unfortunately, you know, working in a democracy, you've got to bring, you know, 50 plus 1 percent along, and uh, at times it's frustratingly hard to do. I also <clears throat> sponsored a carbon tax, and I did make it to a hearing in the Ways and Means Committee, but I wasn't asked back. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joel Fitzgerald, again, Matt, I do, yeah, I like the idea of a carbon tax. I, I think, oh. So um, I just have a couple comments, and I'm probably going to be the elephant in the room I normally am, but um, I want to go back to the minimum wage. You know, and as a parent and as a, as a trade worker most of my life, you know, we're, we're, we've got a big push going now for trade schools and all this stuff, but if we're also supporting minimum wage at $15 an hour, what are we encouraging? You know, and, and that, us as parents and tradespeople and you know, I, I get the fact that workers need more, but if we're saying good enough for $15 an hour for minimum wage is good enough, how are we going to encourage these kids and, and these young folks to go after the $24 an hour trades jobs when a $15 an hour is good enough? And I know that a lot of the people that I work with within the trades and all that stuff, that's why we don't support $15 minimum wage, because it's too easy to sit there and then get aid on minimum wage when we have all these jobs that we're trying to promote to keep these kids here at 20. Right now, I'm hiring people at 24 and 28 dollars an hour, and I can't get them off the couch. But you know, and it's because they're happy making minimum wage or 14 dollars an hour, and and I think that's one of the problems with the state, and that's why. You know, it, it's really hard to, to get on the bandwagon of the $15 an hour. And I don't know what's right or wrong, but I, that's, that's one thing that we see, uh, you know, amongst the trades guys. And then the health care, you know, I, I heard on the radio that the governor, you know, and I don't know if this is true or not, I listened to VPR, and he says, we're looking at $80 million shortfall in the budget. Now, whether that's true or not, but, um, but then we talk about child care for, for people and stuff. You know, that's the other thing is that, you know, a lot of us had to figure it out. We had the same issues. We had childcare and this and that. You know, my, my first wife worked nights and I worked days and we didn't have any childcare. And, and it was a lot of hard work. And, and you know, some, some people feel, and again, the trades guys, that, you know, it's, you know, what are we offering? What, what are we encouraging if we just keep giving this stuff away? And then when I listen to the governor on the radio saying we're $80 million, how do we pay for this stuff? And, and my question is, I would love to do a lot of programs as long as we, we figure out how to pay for it. And then the last thing I have to comment on on the marijuana bill, being going back to the trades, is that, you know, and people driving poorly and all that stuff, but when you're working with people smoking marijuana all day, it's pretty it's pretty dangerous. So I'm not a real supporter of that, but I, I do for the pain thing, but as far as the other thing, I, I'm just not a big supporter of it. But. <clears throat> the minimum wage that's proposed is um, evol evolves over, I think, a five-year period, mm -hmm. and um, I, I certainly understand tradesmen, you know, are being being paid a lot more than that, and I certainly understand that we do need plumbers and electricians mm -hmm. and carpenters and masons, and that we need to start to address that issue and make sure that young people know that those are very well paying jobs and they are you know respected trades and and there's a lot to be said for them but yeah there's a number of people in our state that don't have that education or the opportunity to have that education and I always think of those um, female heads of household 
that are struggling, that are living in homes that probably aren't um, uh, terrific settings, that are working two jobs perhaps, raising a family, trying to keep their children in school and you know prospering and doing the right thing. And um, you know, I, I think most parents try to do that, but it's a real struggle when you don't have the income or you don't have the education. And we have failed a number of people in the state, I believe, over time, and, and we need to address that issue. Um, I just wanted to comment. Um, I think we start every year with the governor saying we're at an $80 million deficit. And this uh, last year, we uh, what was the surplus that we ended up with? It wasn't even a deficit. It was a surplus. And uh, so th that's just... I, I don't listen to that, to tell you the truth. And the way we, um, rather than saying we don't have money, fair and equitable taxation is what we need, not a no new taxes, no new fees thing. We gotta look at where, you know, we can raise money. And, you know, there's certain taxes that I, um, I'm a big fan of the sugar sweetened beverage tax that actually benefits in many ways. It makes people healthier, it reduces Medicaid costs. Um, and um, we, you know, it's hard to get support when you have a governor who will veto it. Uh, just a postscript on the minimum wage issue. Um, at the other end of the population, uh, we can't find enough people to take care of our elders. The jobs pay horribly, and it is incredibly hard work. And obviously the press is now covering the problems that, that arise. So there's another good reason, I think, to you know, when I, in 20 years, I want somebody paid well to care for me. Yeah, Mary, you mentioned uh, cost-benefit, and I think that's the way every program should be looked at. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I don't know how, where I stand with the minimum wage, I do know that when you bring on untrained workers and say, you will earn $15 an hour, the next skill up the line says, wait a second, uh, I think I deserve $20 an hour. And the next one up the line says, well, if, if he's getting 15 and, and now she's getting 20 and at my level, I think it should be 25. It, th there's a cascading effect that, that small business that I've, I've spent 40 years in Vermont working with small business, I'm a CPA, they can't afford it. They simply cannot afford that kind of wage pressure. Um, that that a that, that minimum wage brings on. So uh, I think it's a factor to keep in mind. There is a cost. There is a benefit. Uh, I keep hearing the benefit. I'm I'm not hearing the cost. Um, the income inequality in this country is completely out of control, as I think a lot of us read. Um, it, it's like worse than it was back in the Gilded Age, just before the Great Crash. Um, and um, it, the Sorry, I forgot the other point I was just going to make. I think the arguments that you have posed, I have heard each time we've raised the minimum wage. And um, they've never really happened, that what you say. You know, that this business people find a way, they raise their prices, actually. And, you know, the fact of the matter with that increase in minimum wage, that those are dollars that are spent immediately in the village center. So it is really a mini economic development tool to a lot of places in Vermont because the, that money is not going to Wall Street, it's not going to any place else, it's going to the grocery store and the gas station and some other place in the downtown center. So I think we ought to look at it in, in a positive way and the benefits that it can bring to families in Vermont. Uh, and I just wanted to, I did think of what else I was going to say. It was that um, I think if we took, um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but if we took the minimum wage, I think from the 60s, and just carried it forward with a COLA, we'd be at something like $22 an hour. Right, I appreciate that you just said that, and we could probably talk about minimum wage for a long time, and I think there's, I don't know if there are any economists in the room, they probably have a lot more 
something salient to say, but, and I appreciate everyone's different views on it. The way I look at it, having been a social worker in Vermont for 25 years, working primarily with women with young children, is that <laughs> the cost of regular life driving people into poverty, not, not bad choices that they made, not anything, just life here, because you can't live, you can't, you can't house your children on $11 an hour, even if you are working two jobs. So we have a problem that I think we can't, we just can't avoid that. And if you look at all, again, I'll go back to the science, all the science about what's happening with kids between, well, let's say prenatal to six, we don't even have to say birth to six. That there, there is so much evidence to show that those years are critical and people, and that, and that living in poverty is the main factor that is gonna drive all of the learning problems, criminal justice problems down the road, issues for people. So we can turn a blind eye to that, and, and, and I, I feel for the, the economic cascade. I worked at the Howard Center for 23 years. Trust me, you raise anybody's salary, it's, it changes everybody's salary. And, and you have to start looking at that. But we can't avoid the fact that $15 an hour in Chittenden County is barely a livable wage anymore. I think it's 18 is in Chittenden if you were a single uh, a single person raising one or two kids. So I just don't know how how much longer we go on saying we, we, we can't afford to do this when we can't afford not to do something. Um, that's my rant about it. Anybody else? We have some more time here for our reps. So I have a question. I mean, I, there's a lot of talk about $15 an hour and single women raising children and having a tough time. I worked for the Burlington School District for 16 years as an educational assistant. Um, every year that I worked, I started at $8.34 an hour. I worked there for 16 years, finally busted $20 an hour. Every year, with a little bit more money, we got benefits. If you didn't take the benefits, you got a cash out check at the summer for not taking the benefits if you had a spouse that had benefits. Um, there was always an issue with our contracts where they kept us just under, so they did not have to offer us retirement benefits. The last contract that we had we were 14 minutes shy of them paying us retirement benefits. So with those, with the minimum wage being great, you know, $15 an hour, you know, somebody who's single, who's raising children, and they're getting some benefits, but no retirement. Where does what happens there and why is the city allowed to do that why is that why is the school districts allowed to run their own gamut like that to people who work with the most critical children in the school system and having to basically you, you're their caretaker for the day I wish we had the answer that um, I um, recognize though the hard work that people like you do and the challenges that you are presented every day with some kids that I don't do it anymore but I have a friend that still do. Yeah. I, w I wish I could quote chapter and verse on this but I'm just not prepared to <clears throat> but every time I've heard this issue discussed and heard the argument that you've made that small business people are put out of business essentially if we raise wages I'm told that the outcomes, when this has actually happened in practice, are exactly the opposite. And if you think about it, if I own a corner store selling groceries, and I'm paying my employees a little more, what are they going to do with that money? They're going to buy more groceries for me or somebody else. Also, just the idea that around the world, if you want to fight poverty, you allow women specifically to make more money and the entire fortune of the village goes up. Can I 
<laughs> sure. So um, we have come to the end of your time. Mary and Joy, we really appreciate your coming here this evening and yeah, telling us what you've got in mind for the session and what you've been doing over the, the summer and fall. And um, we look forward to hearing back from you at the end of the session. So next up, we've got Chris Pearson and Philip Baruth who are going to talk to us about what they've got in mind for the upcoming session, what they've been doing over the break, and then we really welcome your comments and questions for them. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Phil Baruth, one of the Chittenden delegation of senators. And um, should we just give you a couple of minutes on what um, what we're working on, or what's the format? Yeah, I think you were indisposed when we talked about it. So we're going to talk about what you've done uh, during the the break in the the uh, summer and fall, and then what your goals are for the upcoming session, and then. We'll hear from folks in the audience. Okay, great. Um, I know you've been uh, talking about the minimum wage. I think it's fair to say that there's um, broad agreement in the House and the Senate to move a paid family leave bill and a minimum wage bill to the governor's desk as quickly as possible when we get back. Those were things that evaded us at the end of last session. Um, and there's been a good deal of work done by our leadership teams on both sides to try to bridge the gap. So I think that's, that's a good thing all the way around. Um, I, I will say for myself, I've been on the Judiciary Committee and I chair the Education Committee. So I've been doing a lot of work with um, prison reform and the problem of, uh, well, we have the women's prison um, here in South Burlington, you probably read the expose in seven days, horrific in many ways. Um, if you did and you were worried about that, you should know that the um, Joint Justice Oversight Committee freed up money along with the Finance Committees to begin design work on a new facility. Um, so we have money underway, options coming back, and Hopefully what we wind up with is something like what we saw from the state of Maine, which was uh, a brand new cutting edge facility with much more humane treatment policies um, and facilities than we see here currently. Um, the other thing that I've been working on a lot is gun safety. And so there are two bills that I plan to push for you might remember that last year, the governor vetoed a waiting period bill. Um, so the intention is to go back again uh, stronger this time on that bill, and also to try to change and strengthen the domestic violence red flag bill that we passed that allows guns to be removed from uh, situations where it seems as though they're in imminent danger of being used um, in a domestic violence incident. The other thing that I'll say is um, just a couple of days ago, I finished work on a bill designed to restrict carry of assault style weapons in the public square. So in auditoriums, churches, uh, stores, political gatherings, outdoor music events, all of the places where people have a genuine right to be worried about mass shootings. Um, the reason for that, if you remember back in August, there was a mass shooting in El Paso, 22 people killed, 24 injured, and that happened in a Walmart. 
About five days later, a guy in Vermont, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, Missouri, decided he wanted to test his Second Amendment rights, so he dressed in body armor and went into his local Walmart to um, make a point and caused mass panic and injuries for first responders trying to get people away from the store. He can't be charged because M Missouri is an open carry state. So what they've done is to charge him with a terrorist threat, which it looks uh, like they will fail to ultimately get through uh, a jury. So my intention here is to make sure that Vermont being an open carry state, we begin the process of defining where we do and do not want assault style weapons. So those are a couple of things. I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Senator Pearson. Thank you, Philip. Um, I serve on uh, the Senate Ag Committee. I'm the Vice Chair of Ag and Forest Products Committee, and I serve on the Finance Committee, which uh, handles revenue, taxes, and also insurance regulation, broadband. It's a quite broad jurisdiction. Um, and over the summer, I, I also serve in a sort of less formal role as the co-chair of what we call the Climate Solutions Caucus, and, and Mary had been the immediate press co-chair, so forgive me if she mentioned this, but we did a lot of work this summer bringing together people about a week after adjournment um, and forming work groups through the summer uh, to try to come up with policy proposals we could move, that we could get to the governor in one session. You know, we worked for four and a half months that would be, so uh, that were achievable and that were also significant. Um, and really trying to lay some foundational work on uh, addressing the climate crisis. So out of that process came 30 pages of ideas and the other co-chair, Sarah Copenhansis from the from the eastern part of the state and I uh, whittled those down into four or five topics. I won't go deeply into them unless we want to, but the transportation, uh, building efficiency, these are one and two sources of our emissions, uh, energy and energy efficiency, and also accountability. So we have this, uh, in the last two months, spent, I think now we've done 15 public forums around the state really trying to inform people, get feedback, and importantly, um, you know, climate activists and, and people who, at the grassroots level are passionate. Of course, we've seen here just downtown, we saw the climate strike with, with our young people speaking out, but what you find is that there's no, you know, every climate activist is kind of interested in different topics, and this reflects the challenge. Uh, you can't just say, well, we want to solve the climate crisis, what has Oregon done? You know, you can take little examples from Oregon and maybe British Columbia and maybe Vermont and maybe Europe, but there's no cohesive package. Do this and we're good, right? And so the activist community reflects that. So we've been trying to help people say, this is what we think we can do. So it's not enough, it's not anywhere near enough, but you know, given the political makeup of the legislature, the governor, uh, and the four and a half months we have, this is what we think we can do. We, we have had, uh, I think, sort of surprised ourselves, it's been pleasantly uh, received. We've had, uh, you know, we had 120 people the other night uh, down the road at BED, and 60 people the night before, Monday night, uh, in Bristol. You know, so Bristol wins per capita, but, uh, and, and really good conversations, and the conversations go something like this. There'll be a couple people who say, it's all a hoax, and there'll be a lot of kids, and they say, this is kind of weak, what you're suggesting. And, and then people in between. So, uh, you know, which sort of reflects the reality of what we, we deal with in Montpelier. So I've been very proud, proud to play that role. This is a, a battle that I've been uh, interested in, invested in for many years, really the reason I got involved in politics. Um, there are other policies outside of that that I, I'm working on, uh, and I'll just mention one because I, I particularly like it, and I think it has a shot. Maine, uh, no, New York, Michigan, New Mexico, Oregon have all um, made an investment in farm to school, as we have. But they have done it in a clever way that we want to replicate. And that is to say, in New York they say, 
if you're meeting 25% of your local school food from local products, we'll give you 25 cents a meal. And that's a huge chunk for, our school lunches cost about $1.80. So that's a significant investment. This seems to me uh, the right kind of incentive. It's idiotic, right, that we have farms struggling and kids going hungry and <laughs> we haven't connected these dots. And when you start uncovering it, there's a lot of system problems of getting, you know, in Essex, the, the principal stops by a local sugar maker, picks up maple syrup, puts it in the back seat of his car, and brings it to school. We don't quite have the systems down. And I've been racking my brain, how do we, how do we deal with the systems? And someone brought this forward and said, maybe you don't deal with the systems. Maybe you make it clear there's an investment coming and the systems kind of build themselves. So that's our approach. Uh, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it, it's not solving the agricultural challenges we have in the state, but it is a significant piece. And, and I think um, you're also seeing some of the farm to school work that we've done around the state so far. And we are doing a good job compared to our neighbors, but we have a long way to go. They're paired not only with local food, but curriculum. So kids are gardening. There's a whole, there's a whole piece to this that's, that's much more important or as important as the local foods. And one of the things I learned recently Sodexo, who does all the food for UVM, they, under a lot of pressure, grassroots pressure, agreed to invest, buy 20% of their food locally. And what, what we're hearing is that the kids who came from Vermont schools, who came from Ver farm, to school, uh, farm to plate schools, I'm not saying that right, who went through a program locally where there was the local ag piece, are really intense about Sodexo and holding Sodexo's feet to the fire. They get it, it's working. And the way I think of it is this, if you have local squash in the cafeteria and nobody eats the squash, <laughs> you haven't solved any problems, right? And so part of what they're able to do through the curriculum and when the kids are touching the vegetables they're producing and then asked to eat them, well, they try them and it turns out they like them. So, it's, it's interesting to just learn that how connected these systems are. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that discussion. I think it's actually a modest investment and, and could make a significant improvement. So there's a lot of issues. We could talk all night about that, but it's probably more important we hear questions. Sorry about the buzz. Uh, Chris, how, how can we make it affordable for a family farm and dairy to both make a living and to treat their animals humanely? Well, if I knew that, Charles, uh, you know, <coughs> um, well, <laughs> this is a big question. And they're workers. Yeah. So, I mean, we live in a country that basically has a broken food system, right? And our farmers are struggling for all sorts of reasons, mostly because the commodity market is completely abusive to them. And this is the side of Wall Street and Chicago's exchange. Uh, and by the way, we're paying for it in lake water quality, we're paying for it in you know all sorts of degradation that is a side effect of that. And not to make add uh, challenges to the table, but we might as well talk about it, our dairy farmers are aging out. And three quarters of the open land in Vermont is controlled by dairy. And their kids don't want the farm. They look at the lifestyle and they're like, no thanks. So we have, we have, we have a, a real imperative to try to figure this out. At the same time, telling farmers what they should be doing is <laughs> a risky endeavor, especially maybe if you're a young whippersnapper from Chittenden County. So there's what we've been trying to do is figure out what are incentives that we can create that would help people make different choices. At the same time, we hear from young people who want to get into farming that they can't find land. So there's also a timing thing, and I'm sorry, it's, a, it's, it's not a one second answer, so bear with me. So a dairy farm is struggling, 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 gets a milk check, and that's it. They just decide, this is it, we're broken. And they sell the cows, and the bigger farmer up the road has been keeping their eye on it and will say, no, we'll take that land, or we'll lease that land. We'll get you out of this pickle. And so what we're seeing is a consolidation, actually. We're not taking acres out of production. We're not actually taking cows off, necessarily, but we're consolidating ownership. 
And I, I think there's strategies that are an option for us to break a bit of that cycle in a way that could allow different caretakers onto that land that are maybe more interested in diversified ag, which has a little less of an impact on our water quality as an example. But the other reality is, uh, if anybody thinks we're solving the climate crisis without an ag as a partner, you know, we got a lot of we got to talk because th this is vital in a couple of ways. One is when we have a sustainable future, we're not trucking tomatoes from California and apples from New Zealand. The other is farms actually are an enormous resource in terms of carbon sequestration, phosphorus sequestration, holding on to the nutrients in the soil. So one of the things that we've set up in the last years underway right now. It's a, a project that people are talking about. It's called Ecosystem Service Payments. And it, it reflects the idea that if you, a farm, let's say this table is a farm, if you are paying farmers for one service, which is milk, they're going to put all efforts into milk. And they degrade the land, frankly, and then they add imports. I mean, we're, we're, we've got a phosphorus crisis. We're importing phosphorus. I mean, this is... Some would say insane. So Ecosystem Services says, well, we're going to pay you for milk, but we're also going to pay you to build soil and to put carbon into soil. And when you regenerate soil, you help us handle flood mitigation, which is a huge problem in and of itself, and also means the, sun, the soil gets spongy, right? And so we're, Vermont is seeing seven to nine inches more rain every year. This is how climate change is showing up for us. And by the way, even, even though in these forums, as I go around the state, there'll be some climate deniers, none of them are farmers. They'll tell you straight up, oh, we're dealing with this all the time. And water is a big deal for them because a lot of them are in low lands. So when you, if you can build soil, you have flood mitigation, you have carbon sequestration, and you find a way to break through some of the dangerous economics of the current, particularly dairy. Um, we are the state that is the singly most dependent on a single commodity of any other state. And this is just part of our history. And we've got to break free, and, and a lot of us are looking at ways to incent more diverse ag um, so that as it shifts, and it's kind of inevitable that it'll shift out of dairy, we can keep our working lands in production. And this is coming back to the farm to school stuff. This is, you know, we ordered also an analysis that we're getting in a, in a few weeks now. Like, what's the capacity in our schools for eggs, for instance? Or, you know, pick your, pick your, like, like help us understand what could we do locally if we were really committed to this? And I think somewhere in there are parts of the answer that I'm hoping we can push for, but it is a huge challenge. It, it goes central to our cultural identity, and it is also trying to impact a part of the economy that is frankly not so interested in a lot of oversight maybe from Montpelier. So you really got to figure out how you can be in the room, be invited to the room, and, and actually have a meaningful you know, shift in what are historic practices. I'm going to try something. Maybe you can Bob Lighty, I have a couple questions. One is, how is the district going to be uh, broken up? And the second one is relative to mass incarceration, which um, it seems like we have this opportunity to change our model from a punishment model to another model. And we also have this opportunity where we've had three colleges close in Vermont. Is there a way to repurpose those buildings into a uh, into a new model for incarceration? Um, so that's three or four questions layered in together. Uh, now, just remind me, what was your first one? Redistricting. Redistricting. 
Um, yes, so all the members of the Chittenden Senate District, all six of us have come out in favor of breaking up the six-member Chittenden District. Now, if you've ever been through redistricting before, I've been through it once in the legislature, it is a crazy process because what you wind up with are a series of maps, one after the other. Joan can uh, attest to how this works. It's a, a series of maps, everybody trying to solve the unsolvable problem of how best to represent uh, different areas, how best to, um, in this case, break up a six-member district traditionally that now can't be, um, according to the, the bill we've gotten behind, larger than three members per district. So you could break up the six-member Chittenden district into two units of three, three units of two, and six units of one, and everybody's going to make an argument about why X, Y, or Z makes the most sense. What I will say, in terms of my own thinking about it, I think there has been, in, in many ways, it's undemocratic to have a six-member district. It has also been advantageous to people in Chittenden County traditionally to have that. So I would be for two, three-member districts rather than uh, breaking it up any further because I do think there's, uh, there's strength in those numbers. With that said, I don't see any way that you can look at the demographics and not anchor one of those with Burlington and one with Essex. So Essex and Burlington are not going to both wind up in the same three-member district or the same two-member district. So I think however you look at it, you're looking at an anchor of Burlington in one, Essex in the other, then it's anybody's guess how those other communities are shaped around those anchors. But if you're from Essex, uh, and, and I go out there pretty frequently and hear the complaints, people have a 30-year gripe, which is that they have been a very rapidly developing community, second or third largest in the state always, and they haven't been able to get people from Essex representing them in the state center. So fair enough. I think their, their uh, long drought will be over one way or the other. Um, on, the, on the idea of using campuses that are shut down as institutions of higher learning and reopening them as um, places for incarcerating prisoners, I'm, I'm skeptical myself, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. Um, people say the same thing about child care centers. Can't we just put them into unused parts of public schools? And the answer is yes, you can do that. But those places aren't designed for toddlers. There's a different matrix that you want when you have zero to three than when you have five to uh, eight or five to 10 year olds in a building. It's different safety concerns, different um, things that you want to be soft instead of hard, um, different uh, security concerns. I fear the same would be the, the case with trying to repurpose the buildings on a college campus. We'd wind up retrofitting them in ways that were not really suitable for the kind of therapeutic environment that we're hoping for. So I'm supporting uh, the creation of a new facility. We had presentations from the state of Maine and they have an amazing thing going on, a brand new state-of-the-art <laughs> campus that has three different facilities on it. One is for uh, their female prisoners to be incarcerated, but also a step-down facility as they get ready to end their sentences. And the other, a larger facility for male um, prisoners. Very much state-of-the-art, much less punitive, a more open floor plan, with behavioral systems that go along with that, something that came out of the Scandinavian model. So um, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to reusing a campus if it could be shown to be in line with what's actually best practice. Hi, Philip. Uh, your, your discussion of the gun venue 
yes. ideas you're working with. You were you were speaking about assault weapons, and the press is reporting your ideas had to do with semi-automatic weapons, which would include handguns and long rifles. Could you clarify that? And the the follow-on to that was, I always question how those are things are going to be enforced. Yeah, yeah. So Vermont Digger um, reported this uh, and changed their headline because they didn't feel like it was fully accurate, but. It, it refers to semi-automatic weapons. So semi-automatic pistols, semi-automatic rifles, and it draws those definitions from legislation in California that has been vetted through the courts. So um, the, the basic argument that you hear from gun rights activists is that semi-automatic weapons are useful to them to hunt and to target shoot. This bill doesn't touch either of those functions. It doesn't say you can't have them in your house. It doesn't say you can't have them in your car. What it does say is you can't bring them into Walmart. It does say you can't bring them into a church, a bar, uh, an outdoor music venue, and so on and so on, including child care facilities. So my question back to those people is, Hunting and target shooting are protected. Why do you need them in a child care facility? Why do you need them in a church? And the answer is always, and my colleague John Rogers, um, very prominent gun rights activist, said in the Digger article uh, that he needs them in those venues for self-protection. And I think that's just a ludicrous response to a very real uh, challenge in our society. So Chris, I guess this is peripheral to the marijuana legislation, but you seem to be know a lot about agriculture. Is there concern or anyone talk about that when, hopefully when, it's legalized that the hemp and the marijuana production among farmers will reduce their farming of vegetables, et cetera, and drive up those costs? I'm sorry, so is the, are you worried that we're displacing vegetables yes. farming? Um, I think most people see not that concern, but I see a, the opportunity, and hemp is proving this, uh, to be an ancillary source of income for dairies, for instance, um, who are really struggling, and so they say, okay, we'll plant an acre of hemp. Uh, we take it out of corn, put it into hemp. Um, you know, with marijuana's is there's, I think, some potential for it to be a boon to the ag economy, but I also don't think we're gonna be driving down the road and seeing, instead of corn, marijuana plants. Um, you know, there's a whole security issue that you gotta deal with. Um, you know, you don't have a distillery in your front yard, right? It's the same, same kind of challenge. So, uh, most people that I mean, I think most of us think there is a potential to strengthen the rural economy uh, by bringing marijuana economy above t above board. Um, I don't think it's a panacea by any stretch. I think somebody mentioned marijuana revenue in the question with our house friends. You know, at some level, the joke is we've spent that six times. It's not going to be a huge windfall. I don't think. See, Philip's got a, another bill. I, I do too. I, you know. Um, and we're pretty serious, I think, about investing in prevention and, and education. You know, this is not, people giggle about it, but it's, you know, we gotta take it seriously. I don't think, uh, and I just wanna make sure, you, you said when we legalize, we have legalized today. When we tax and regulate, and regulate is what's exciting to me, you get a lot of benefits of safety, of understanding pesticides and how it inter intersects. We've seen all that, seen the headlines about vaping. Most of that's marijuana. You know, we got <laughs> those are out there. We've got a, the only shot at making that safe, I think, is regulation, strong regulation. So I don't know if I got to your question. We've got 10 more minutes, so. Please chime in if you'd like. Somebody has a hand. Okay. Like this? Oh, okay. Um, I want 
wanted to talk a little bit to circle around to what was brought up earlier in the evening and it had to do with um, affordability in Burlington and more specifically like housing and this sort of thing. So today I went to realtor.com just to get an idea of what house prices are like and I was quite, quite honestly astonished. Uh, now I don't know how believable the numbers are, I would expect that they would probably be pretty reasonable. But it turns out that the median household or the median residential um, value for a house in Burlington was $411,250. Um, and then they broke it down by a few areas, like the South End, $426,000. The Old North End, $432,000. Downtown, $400,000. And it was, that's a lot of money. So I was looking at it a little bit more closely and looking at my tax bill that's been progressively going up and up and up. And I was wondering if there's anything that you have in the hopper this year that's going to give homeowners in Burlington some tax relief. Because to compound the matter, um, I think about a year and a half ago, the income sensitivity um, amount was dropped down to $400,000, which means like if you make, if your house is assessed at more than $400,000, you lose the income sensitivity and you're going to bear the full brunt of the hurricane. And I was doing a little bit of calculating and it's a dramatic increase. So I was wondering if there was anything that was planned for this, um, any, any kind of relief, because to make matters worse, we're going to be building a new high school and that's going to also add to the, the property taxes over the next five to ten years. So what I'm kind of concerned about is that we're like, we're you know, we're, we're building ourselves into a perfect storm that really needs to be addressed right now because five, ten years down the road, it's probably going to be too late. So I'm wondering if there's anything that you have in mind as far as property tax relief and that would probably also affect affordability because if someone's going to go in and buy a house and spend $350,000 and also face a mortgage and a tax, tax bill, which are going to be about the same, how are they going to afford that? Um, so a number of thoughts jumped to mind. The change that shifted the cap of your property value didn't say once you're over 400 you get nothing. It, 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 I believe, and I'm looking at others to make sure I have this right, it said that the income sensitized will be up to, the, up to $250,000 of your home value. So the, the amount on top of that, you're paying full freight, but you, you're not going to zero just to understand the current system. For many years, I have proposed that we make everybody income sensitized. And when you do that, you get a lot more money from the very wealthy, and it allows you to subsidize the rest of us, about a 10% break. Uh, that's been tricky. I uh, haven't gotten the votes for that. This year, I um, have a colleague uh, who's colorful in the Senate, Mark McDonald from Orange County, and he was around when we created Act 60 and Act 68. And he will say often, 80% of Vermonters used to be income sensitized, and that number is down to about 67%. And I said, all right, you know, and, and by the way, the, the very wealthiest in Vermont have had a huge boon for thanks to the federal tax cuts, Trump tax cuts, like, like, I don't know, $170 million worth of tax breaks. So the idea is, well, could you take some of that savings and apply it to ease the rest of our tax bill. So I asked our fiscal office to say, what would it look like if we set an 80% target? And say, the bottom 80% of Vermonters are going to be income sensitized. And I was surprised to learn that, in fact, they are income sensitivity eligible. But for that, that gap there from 67, which are taking income sensitivity up to 80%, they're better off paying their property tax. So that wasn't, I've been exploring that, hoping this would be another approach that maybe I could get by in. We face a real quandary. We keep voting for school budgets. We, keep, we voted to build a new high school and, and we keep complaining that property taxes go up. And, and I, I mean, I, I don't, you know, I pay these too and they're, it's a real burden. Uh, but we sort of want to have it all, and this is tricky, and, and we, of course, want to invest in our education system, and we need to. 
And so the funding, finding a better solution has eluded us. It seems to continue to elude us. Um, I have been advocating now that I'm on the finance committee, which deals with the property tax rate. Um, there's been a, anytime there's a surplus in the ed fund, we tend to use that surplus to buy down the rates. And, and I sort of looked at that last year and I was like, well, this is ridiculous. Why <laughs> we buy down the rates this year? We're going to crank up the rates next year. Wouldn't we, why wouldn't we smooth this out? Just like you would in a, in a, if you suddenly had a windfall in your steady budget at home, you, you wouldn't necessarily blow it all at once. We got, I think we proposed to, to keep half of it that way and that got further willed down. So, the, you know, but that's not going to really hit it, but it's, you know, make a real impact, even if I had gotten everything I was asking for there. We're trying to make it predictable. We're trying to make it smooth. We're trying to keep the rates down and people keep voting for school budgets. And, and so we, I'm not satisfied with our system. I think that it does, it is a regressive system. It, you know, very wealthy people are paying about 1% on their property tax, 1% uh, uh, on their income at the most, if not a half percent. Income sensitivity gets you about 3%. So, so it's clearly a real problem for working people. And, and then we keep voting to approve school budgets, and, and I support that too. So it, it is, you know, we're, we're sort of stuck here, and I don't have great answers, and the answers that I have, and I've been very vocal about this, I tried to put forward, and, and I'm looking at Joey years ago, I mean, one of the first things I ever did the, when I was a House member of 2007 was stand with Joey and a Republican, and we said we should pay for schools based on our income tax. And, you know, we generated some discussion, but it didn't go anywhere. And it, this, is, this is a vexing problem. I don't know if you... The only thing I'll add is, <clears throat> I, I, when I came in, you were discussing, I think, the administration's projections of shortfall of $70 million um, for the coming year. That's based mostly on the projections around healthcare growth in the educational um, system. So VHI, the group that puts forward the plans for teachers in the, in the state, um, they are projecting an 11, 12% increase over last year. And that's not because we are exceptionally generous in Vermont, that's nationally, those are going up in those ways. So Tim Ash, who's not here tonight, but is the Senate President pro tem, he likes to call healthcare the blob that's eating everything. And I think in this case, you can see that the, the property tax, we think about property tax, we know there's a direct connection to education. I think over the years that has led to a demonization of teachers, demonization of school staff. It's not teachers, it's not school staff, it's healthcare. And healthcare, if you look at it, it goes like this over the last 15 years. So Bernie is out campaigning for Medicare for all. Um, Democrats generally are campaigning for things that I think will, um, should they become law, help to flatten out the growth rate for medical costs. But you see the pushback that Democrats are getting everywhere around the notion of Medicare for all um, as though it itself would break the bank when in fact it's not doing something systemic for health care that is breaking the bank, not just in Burlington, not just in the school budgets, but in municipal budgets everywhere around the state. Can I, I'm just wondering. You have one minute. Okay, well. 30 seconds. <laughs> Um, I think we have to talk about UVM, frankly. They, they put a lot of pressure on, you know, having, having half the students roughly live in, in town means that uh, investment properties for landlords are really attractive and then they push people out. And, and, you know, I've been on my friends on city council to try to push back. There has been an effort to get UVM to house more people but I think there needs to be an ongoing campaign there. The other thing I would say is affordable housing generally in Chittenden County and across the state is a real problem. We have attempted just last year, Senator Sorokin, another Chittenden County Senator, pushed for a $50 million housing bond. 
you know, this is great economic development, and this is a, a, an ongoing crisis for far too many families to afford basic housing. Um, we didn't get that across the finish line, but um, we have simply have to do a better job of creating affordable housing and trying to balance this out. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of our senators. We appreciate your being here tonight. And thank you to all of you for coming and for your questions and your comments and your interest. If you enjoyed this evening, please tell your neighbors. Let all your people in Ward 6 know about our meetings. They're the first Thursday of every month. Our next meeting is February 6th. We hope that we see you all. Uh, we've had an increase in our budget, fortunately, which is allowing us to provide meals and music at this meeting. So uh, please come back, save the first Thursday of every month for free dinner. Except January, yes, and July and August. Um, yeah, please, we hope to see you all in February and uh, lots of your friends and neighbors. And thank you to all our presenters. We appreciate your taking the time to be with us tonight.